Chris Mannix at Sports Illustrated back here on the Rich Eisen Show. Good to see you, Chris. How are you, sir? I'm good, Rich. I'm glad that you are here to explain to me. Uh, do you have the game ball? Did you take it to Phoenix <laughs> from last night? Do you have Giannis's game ball, Chris? What the hell was that? What was that? That was that was an aggressive reaction from Giannis Tendakumpo. I mean, Giannis has accomplished a lot in his career. He's a former MVP, an NBA champion. He's put up incredible individual statistics. For him to react that way over a game ball that recognized his 64th point or 64-point game, it, it just made no sense to me. My reaction was similar to the reaction of Tyrese Halliburton. If you looked at him in that moment, he's kind of looking at Giannis and probably thinking the same things I just said to you. Like, why, oh, why do you want this particular game ball? But, you know, for whatever reason, Giannis wanted it. Well, I mean, it's uh, a personal best. It's a Bucks best. And apparently he sends game balls to his mom. Like, apparently that's, that's, the, well, that's the deal. Yeah, that's, and look, I, I, I'd be the, the comment he made afterward that stuck out with me was that he doesn't have the ball from game six of the NBA <laughs> finals. Like, that's the ball that I would want, not, you know, an individual achievement in a relatively meaningless regular season game. Well, I guess that, that that's also my point, too, uh, that I just made is the NBA – you know, obviously we'll look into this, but deep down they got to be thrilled that the in-season tournament has created bad blood that's spilled into the rest of the regular season. Like they, this apparently comes from Halliburton's Dame time moment after hitting the game sealer against the Bucks in the semifinal in Vegas, and uh, and they came in hot last night, the Bucks against the Pacers. Yeah, they're the 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 bad blood between these two teams has been brewing. And look, part of that is what happened in the in-season tournament. Part of it is kind of a rise in Indiana over the last couple of years. I mean, that in-season tournament, one thing it uh, showcased was that the Pacers are for real. They have been a team on the rise for really the last three years, two and a half years since they got Tyrese Halliburton. Halliburton's playing at an MVP level, and – you know, the intensity of that semifinal game uh, was playoff-like. And, you know, if these two teams ever wind up meeting down the line in a postseason series, I think you'll you'll have some spiciness attached to it. Uh, so uh, just some other curious questions here. Um, and then we'll get to the other, uh, I guess, clearly more uh, serious matters at hand. How many basketballs are used in an NBA game? How many are there? So, so before a game, the – the uh, the referees and I believe two of the players, you know, selected players, effectively pick out two balls. Like there's a rack of balls that gets rolled out for players to warm up with uh, before the game, halftime, all the stuff you see, you know, over the course uh, of a game. Two of them are selected before the game that are to be used for as game balls. One is obviously put into play right away. The other is on standby in case there's an incident involving blood or. You know, some other other issue with the ball. So there are two balls that are defined as game balls. Clearly, Giannis won the one that was in play. Uh, and, and Rick Carlisle said after the game, look, we don't necessarily need the one that was in play. Just give us one of the game balls to honor our rookie's first career point. So th this felt like a situation that probably could have been easily diffused with a little more conversation and not an altercation. And how often does the second game ball get used? Have you ever seen something like that? I like don't what? see it happen all that often. When I see it happen, primarily when I see it happen is if there, if blood gets on a ball, uh, right? So, yeah. you know, if you have a guy that gets cut, a little bit of blood gets on the ball, they're not just going to wipe it off with, with a towel. They're going to, you know, basically take it out of circulation, at least for the rest uh, of that game. That's primarily when a second ball comes into play. All right. Just, these are fascinating things to me. I never, I never, like, honestly, I, I saw that last night. I, and when I heard about Giannis wanted the game ball, I thought to myself, they can't have only one basketball in an NBA arena. I mean, you just watch these players warm up. There's 50 of them out there. You and know? Rich, like, they're, they're, they're all the exact same ball. Like, it's, it's not like there are two <laughs> balls that are different than the other balls that are played. They are quite literally the exact same <laughs> basketballs 
that are rolled out there on the rack. I think it's like six across, four down. Yep. I mean, you're talking to a former ball boy, Rich. So I, <laughs> I have a deep knowledge of the <laughs> basketballs <laughs> in an NBA arena. They are the exact same. They're all the exact same that are put out there. So when Giannis says it didn't really feel like the one that uh, we were playing with, yeah. That doesn't really line up with kind of what I know about the game. I was about to say, so are you speaking as an NBA insider right now, or are you speaking as a former ball boy right now, Chris? A little bit of both. Okay. I'm tapping into both That's of my fantastic. knowledge. Base. And so I guess now that leads to my last question, I swear, and then we will move on. Uh, was the ball boy last night, like, freaking out? Was there was there some young ball boy last night in that arena just freaking about a basketball Chris, but, probably probably yeah. not because you know once you know you saw the, the the security director for the bucks immediately go and get his hands on one of them yes um in in that moment and again speaking as a former ball boy in a situation like that where i am a teenager making like 50 bucks a game <laughs> i'm staying the hell away from that <laughs> i want no part of whatever's going on between Giannis and the indiana pacers chris mannix here <laughs> former ball boy senior writer for sports illustrated or w- were you a senior ball boy should i uh, should i give i got to senior ball boy okay. when you get when you get to your senior year of college you're still a ball boy that's where? your senior ball where boy. was this where was this this is in boston for uh almost 10 years in the garden uh, I never got into the old garden. I was the first uh, first year of the new building. Oh, really? Okay. Did yeah. you did so? Did you who? Did you ever have like a run in with anybody at any point in time as a ball boy? Oh, uh, we could do. We'll we'll have to do this the next time, Rich. There's a lot of ball okay. boy stories I can okay. tap into. Okay, very good. Sure. All right, we'll now in fact move on. All right. So <laughs> what 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 do you know about the decision to give Draymond Green an indefinite suspension by the league? So. The NBA's thinking in all this is that they don't believe that just giving Draymond a set number of games is going to make any kind of impact. And they're basing that on very recent history. They've suspended Draymond Green four times in effectively the last nine months. They suspended him for five games just a month ago. So the NBA you know, came to the conclusion that just giving him a defined number of games where he doesn't have to work towards anything. He doesn't have to show them anything. He just has a date where he's allowed back on the floor, and that's that. They decided that wasn't working. So in making this an indefinite suspension, they're putting benchmarks on this. You know, I don't know specifically what they're going to ask Draymond Green to do, and it is muddy waters to kind of wade into you know, making mental health decisions, making emotional health type of decisions. But the NBA is going to want to see some things from Draymond Green before they allow him uh, back on the floor. That's why it's my belief, and this is more just a belief than anything the NBA is telling me at this point, you're going to exceed 10 games Mm. with this suspension before we ultimately see Draymond back on the floor. Any idea of how uh, Green is taking this? You know, I've had some short conversations, text conversations with people around him. Um, I I would imagine he's frustrated by the indefinite suspension, but I think he's going to do what he has to do to get back on the floor. I mean, look, Draymond knows that what he did was completely out of line. That's why he was immediately in the media room after the game trying to do some damage control, apologizing. You didn't hear him apologize to Rudy Gobert. In the aftermath of that incident, he apologized to Yusuf Nurkic. He did get defensive, though, about this idea that this was similar to what happened with Gobert. With Gobert, he made a bad decision to go in there and jump on him. He seemed to con- he continued to suggest that this was just a basketball move, that he was kind of flailing to sell a foul. And I can tell you, the league didn't buy that, and I didn't buy that. Like that, you know, Draymond came up and wound up and clocked Yusuf Nurkic across the skull uh, with the side of his forearm. That That's not a, a basketball player trying to sell a basketball play in any stretch. So he's going to have some work to do uh, in showing the league that he's ready to get back on the floor. Yeah, and it's uh, and he couldn't use as an excuse that he didn't know Nurkic's whereabouts because he was wearing Nurkic as a cape pretty much the, for the entire uh, sequence where he was yeah, posting up. I had, you know, I had I some mean, people, yeah, I had some people telling, texting me afterwards, like, look, this, you know, it, it, the foul itself was a modest foul by Yusuf Nurkic. You know, course. the kind of play you see all the time. He had 
kind of a grip on his jersey on the right side. Draymond Green swung, uh, hit him on the other side. Uh, what what people were texting me after the game was, you know, look, Nurkic was kicking his backside in all game long. Like there was more of the frustration that probably had to do with that than anything was happening specifically in that moment. Right, and then to say uh, as well uh, that uh, I'm apologizing for it because I didn't mean to do it. If I meant to do it, I would be unapologetic, which is something that if my five-year-old said, Susie and I, my wife and I would sit him down and or her down and say, what are you, what are you, what are you saying? Like th- there's a certain thing called remorse and respect and what have you. So I guess my question for you is, is that uh, does anything, because we're, and I know this is treading into dangerous waters here, or or, or ten, uh, uh, tenuous is probably a better word for it, Chris, it is, again, it was March and then April and then November and then December, all in this calendar year. And the Jordan Poole incident that went without him being suspended by his own team, again, I, I don't know all the details right there. Is there anything that's that's happened with Draymond Green to cause this string of of acting out in in ways that are one shocker after another chris it's re- it's really hard to say because I, I don't know of anything specific going on in the life of draymond green sure. that would trigger something like this uh i, I do think that the frustration level uh, are, within draymond green has to be at an all-time high for a couple of reasons one the warriors are not very good like they have been healthy for most of this season, and they have not been very good. 10 and 13 on the year. Draymond has taken a step back. Clay Thompson has taken a step back. Andrew Wiggins has taken a step back. So this is kind of the, you're you're witnessing sort of the crumbling of the dynasty. And along those same lines, you know, Draymond is not the same type of player. I I heard Charles Barkley in an interview recently, you know, talk about how like when he wasn't, the same kind of guy he would lash out in stuff like this he took a shot at othella harrington at the end of his time in houston because othella while he wasn't the player that uh charles barkley was he played harder and was able to do things that charles couldn't do so i think that probably plays into it as well the regression of the golden state warriors as a team and the regression of Draymond Green as a player. Yeah, I heard Charles said that I think it was on DP show, Chris, and then and that was in, on the heels of him um, in, in the broadcast where Turner's here and ESPN's there. He screams over at Bob Myers on the ESPN set, you know, like you, you left the sinking ship just in time. And I'm sure Draymond hears that, and I'm sure that that all sinks in in that spot, you know, when he's getting frustrated. It's just it, – No, it, it – yeah, it, it absolutely does. And look, the Warriors are in a difficult position right now. They, they've got Steph Curry still playing at an MVP level, but the rest of these guys are not. And Clay Thompson on an expiring contract has almost no trade value. Draymond Green with four years left on his contract has zero value at this point. Andrew Wiggins looks like the guy we saw kind of struggling through Minnesota and not the guy we saw the last couple of years. So uh, I think they're – you know, they're in a predicament where I don't know what writes the ship in Golden State. So uh, before I let you go here, what is the story you're going to be keeping an eye on over the next six weeks to unfold for this season as we, we head it into the, the Christmas time era? And then uh, and then obviously the trade deadline coming up after an all star game. What do you what do you what are you keeping an eye on here? Chris. Well, you know, for starters, just exactly what Golden State does off the top, because look, you, you don't trade Steph Curry in season, that's for sure. But at the end of the year, does a discussion take place with a guy who's got two years left on his contract about does he want to be here while this team is going through some kind of rebuild? The more short term story is can John Morant save the Grizzlies season? And <laughs> Memphis is bad. They are a bad basketball team right now, but we're about, what is it, uh, a week away from John Morant being eligible to return for Memphis. So it'll be very interesting to see if just injecting him back into the lineup puts a Grizzlies team that, look, believed it had, you know, finals potential just months ago if he can make a difference this late in the season. And then any other conversation about Jokic getting ejected in in Eastern Conference arenas where he's only there one time and fans in Detroit and fans in Chicago, Chicago fans there for Serbia night. Uh, he gets a one technical ejection. And what, what's the conversation you're hearing on that front? Officially? Yeah, that's tough. I, I don't hear a lot about 
you know, and it, it is sort of strange, the, the cities that it's happened in and the circumstance. And look, Jokic has had a very un Jokic like stretch as of late. He hasn't been playing his best basketball. So maybe some frustration settles in mm. for him as well. But look, he, you know, overall, you're going to see Jokic back in the MVP conversation over the next couple of months. And if you're talking about a team to beat, Rich, it's still the Denver Nuggets, you know, at the top of that totem pole. Chris, thanks for the time. Greatly appreciate it, brother. You be well. You got it. That's at SI Chris Mannix, bringing his expertise as an insider and former ball boy here on the Rich Eisen Show. (laughs) Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free. 